Good morning, everybody. Lovely to, to see you all. Um, so I'm going to just kick straight in, because if you want to know more about me and research and stuff, you can always look that up, and it's a bit tedious. Uh, what have they got in common, do you think? When you look at this, what comes to mind? It's a bit of a trick question, but never mind. Big corporations. Big corporations, OK, yeah. Huh? Innovation. Innovation. Anything else? Control. Control. Scandals. Scandals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I usually say, well, they've all got in common scandal. Either they've had one or they're about to have one. I, d I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody always looks, really? <laughs> um, actually, it's quite interesting because um, uh, Google, who I haven't put up there, uh, would have been up there, you know, in terms of one of the most innovative organisations. And here we go, yesterday, there's quite an interesting example mm -hmm of speaking up and how do we affect change in organisations. But you've got up here a number um, of organisations who have faced, um, well, they've basically been on the front news of the newspaper, front page of the newspaper um, for not really good reasons. I mean, when we started in 2015, this particular project, uh, VW, the emissions scandal, had just happened. And actually, it took everybody's certainly the clients at Ashridge a bit by storm because it was like but VW nothing can happen to VW you know they're infallible um, so they've got we've got doping scandals emissions scandals financial scandals sexual harassment scandals so one reason why the topic of speaking truth to power is so um, hot at the moment is that there's quite a few organisations across all sectors uh, that want to make sure that misconduct is not happening, yeah, and that there's some level of transparency. The other reason is, though, that they, these organisations are innovative. Yeah, so some of them. <laughs> Netflix, we've got um, uh, Amazon up there, Unilever, Tesla. Um, now, they're listed on the Forbes most innovative organisations in the world. Now, you do not get to be on that list unless, to some degree, you have a culture where people can stick their hands up and say, I've got a really crazy idea, and I'm going to tell it, and somebody's going to listen to me and actually take it seriously. So there's also organisations up there where speaking truth to power is vitally important to enable that creativity. So essentially, uh, they've all got something to do with speaking up and listening up. Uh, that's a big one, and it might be you know, of real interest to you guys coming here. There's the transparency argument. We need to know about misconduct. We need to have a culture whereby people can talk about and challenge current practices. But there's also this thing about, well, if we need to disrupt, if we have a world that's just amazing on our doorstep, that's one word you could use to describe it, with uh, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, we've got to have people that have the capacity to stick their hands up and offer ideas. Um, and it's really interesting, as a kind of business school professor, I'm always asked for the business case on my research. You know, it, which really drives me mad sometimes, because sometimes I just think, isn't it blatantly obvious why we need to have a speak up culture? And yes, OK, there's that. And yes, there's that. But actually, what you, what we choose to say day to day, every day in our conversation, what we choose to speak up about and what we choose to stay silent about defines ourselves, our sense of identity. When you think about it, it's the difference between whether you are proud of how you are at work, but also at home, actually, or if you feel sort of uncomfortable because you're not being the person that you want to be. And uh, as you can probably tell, I'm quite interested in that reason as well, yeah? The kind of purpose, fulfillment, reaching our potential, and yes, the kind of motivation that goes with it. So that's the background 
those may be reasons why you're quite interested in this subject as well. And we've done, you know, over the last three years, um, probably over 200 interviews. We've surveyed an awful lot of people, uh, nearly 2,000 now. Um, and we've, we've done what we call organisational ethnography. We've been in and out of various organisations observing and interviewing people from top to bottom. Um, as well as action research. So it's a multi-methods uh, three-year uh, project to date. And um, just a couple of top-line things before I go into some of the details. Um, this may sound obvious, but the first thing I want to really land is that speaking up is relational. So when we talk about speaking truth to power, genu generally what we hear is people kind of going, they need to speak up more. They. They need, they need to have courage and speak up. Which is all very well, but when I'm told that, I then go and talk to they. And they tell me, yeah, right. I'm hardly going to speak up because the last person that spoke up disappeared. <laughs> Or the, you know, yes, I'm not going to speak up because it will make no difference whatsoever. So speaking up happens in between, yes, the courage to speak up, but also the really skillful invitation, an environment in which to help people to speak up. And sometimes we focus so much on telling people to speak up and not enough on the, well, hang on a second, particularly if you're in a position of power, how do, you make, how do you enable that to happen really well? So we look at both sides of the coin, if you see what I mean, and I'll, I'll talk about that today. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, um, generally speaking, we think that we're better at this than everybody else. <laughs> and I'll come on to some survey results. Um, I, don't think I, I don't think you've been involved in the survey that went out. It's actually the data from the appraiser conference. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's over 100 responses from, a, from that medical um, uh, uh, group. And we tend to think that other people need to do this much better. And we focus much more on that than turning the lens on ourselves. Um, more about that in a bit. Um, this bit is the biggest blind spot, how we listen to others, and in particular, <coughs> how we might inadvertently silence other people. We don't mean to. We don't even know we're doing it, but we are silencing people. And the final thing is that this whole lovely <coughs> situation and phenomenon is mediated with, through power our perceptions of power. And I won't go into this, but I, I could spend a day talking about this. I'm not meaning power as this kind of fixed thing that some people have and some people don't have. I'm talking about our perceptions of power. How powerful do I feel in this context, in this relationship, in comparison to those perceptions of power really affect whether we feel like we will speak or whether we think, uh, maybe not, and whether we feel that we'll listen or not. So more about that in a bit as well. Now, when we've um, looked at all of our data so far, we've picked out, uh, for the purpose, we're, we're writing a book at the moment, which is coming out next year for the Financial Times, and we wanted to put our data and some of our key points in a, in a framework that people might remember. So we call it the Truth Framework slightly forced fit, <laughs> bear with me. Um, so uh, these are some of the issues that happen in the choice whether to speak up and whether to listen up. And I'm going to talk you through them from each perspective. So speaking up, and as I talk through this, maybe you could just gently cast your mind back to a time where you've chosen to speak up about something or when you've chosen not to. And it doesn't have to be some dramatic whistle-blowing event. It could be that decision whether to give your colleague that bit of feedback 
you know, that would actually be really helpful for them, but it's a bit embarrassing, so you're probably not going to. Yeah, that sort of stuff. So speaking up, what affects it? Well, first of all, we have to trust in the value of our own opinion. Sort of the ignition key. Do I have something that's valuable to say? Do I have a contribution to make? Do I care about something enough to speak up about it? And if we, if we think we have, if we care enough, the very next question on the tip of our tongue, and what will happen if I say it? That's the risk. Okay, so these two things are like we're weighing them. So we, we have, we've talked to a number of whistleblowers <coughs> in our interviews, obviously, um, and one uh, was probably one of the most powerful interviews that I took of a, of a person that discovered that her, she, um, he was working for uh, a charity and he discovered that her, um, his chief executive was committing fraud. And so he spoke up about it. And he said, you know, I care deeply about it. So I, I said something. And uh, as a result of him speaking up, um, it was on the front page of the newspaper. It went to court. It was very public. The pressure on him and his family was extreme. And it had really tragic results for his family. Um, very tragic. Um, and uh, in this interview, I, I said to him, knowing the risks now, would you have still spoken up? And he said, no way. You know, if, I, if I'd have realised what would happen, no. And then he paused and he looked <coughs> really torn. And then he said, oh, but how could I not? Yes, I would have spoken up. So, that, you know, you get that real kind of like, do, do I care about this enough? Have I got something important to say? And am I prepared to deal with the risks? And interestingly, that's a dramatic story, but, but very often the risks that we're talking about involve, and the two key risks that were pointed out by the group that have filled in this survey uh, at the other site, um, were the risk of being perceived negatively or the risk of upsetting another person. So we make a lot of our choices on whether am I going to be perceived badly for saying this or am I going to upset somebody? And we very often stay silent. So those, those risks keep us quiet very often. Um, if we do decide to speak up, this is sort of the context. Understanding refers to understanding politics. Um, so the political environment. If you speak up, it's a political act. It can't help but be political in the sense that you are affecting and talking to people's agendas yeah, and different interests. So you will be affecting that when you speak up about something uh, material. And so many of our interviewees have told us about the importance of having some level of understanding around who's powerful in this system, what's the games that need to be played in order to be heard in this system, and we know that it is quite helpful to know that, yeah? And we also know that new people into systems <laughs> often have no clue. <laughs> da, 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 and then they go and say something and everybody goes, <laughs> which can, of course, be quite a good thing, because at least somebody's saying something. But yeah, so understanding politics is about um, power, agendas, who knows who, and what do you have to do round here? We, we interviewed a, a, a COO of one of the biggest uh, global banks who was talking to us about the financial scandal and the LIBOR scandal. And he said, um, he said with politics, he said, it all begins with this organisation's biggest lie, which I thought was so dramatic. Um, and I don't know whether you can guess what the biggest lie was. Budgets. So he said, you know, you mention the word budgets and the lying begins, he said. <laughs> he said, there's a way of doing budgets and you have to just know how it's done. And if you kind of don't get that, it's very difficult to get your point, in, uh, your point across. Uh, so I thought that was quite a good example of understanding. Titles, 
Um, uh, titles refers to the labels that we apply to one another, the titles and labels. Not just job titles, but other forms of labels. So, um, so as I started to speak and you looked at me, you were maybe consciously, but probably, un well, certainly unconsciously, maybe consciously, <laughs> labelling me. Yeah, so you, you've labelled me woman, you've labelled me British, you've labelled something to do with my age and appearance, which we don't need to go into. Uh, you've, um, yeah, I would give a few titles, researcher, academic, professor, whatever else. So all these labels get put on me, and depending on the context, that will kind of, you'll perceive me with certain levels of status or and authority as a result. So, uh, in my, uh, an example I often give is in my 20s, I was a management consultant, and, uh, and very often in the in uh, boardroom tables, presenting analysis, and my um, manager, in a performance review, said to me, the problem is, Megan, that when you come into the room, you get labelled young and woman. I mean, it's true. It was true. I mean, I couldn't really do anything about that. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to change that. But of course, young and woman, in the context of a boardroom table in the 1990s, and sadly, still so, uh, does not shout status and authority, listen to this person. Quite the opposite. Uh, so I had to work really hard to be taken <coughs> seriously. Okay? So when we speak up, we are often maybe unconsciously aware of how do I label myself? How are other people labelling me? And how am I labelling these people out here? What does that mean for my relative status, authority, right to say something? Fascinating, fascinating area. So in here, we've got different departments, haven't we? I imagine. Uh, and we've got different job titles, different seniorities. And they all come with a certain level of expectation. And then in some organisations, director or chief executive doesn't mean that much. Over here, oh my God, it means a lot. And it means, right, they talk, you listen. Over here, uh, this is a particular one. I work with a lot of HR teams. In this organisation, HR means seat at the table, people are our most important asset, listen to this person. And over here, HR means processes, redundancies. <laughs> yeah? And so, you know, th these labels, we often don't talk about them, but they are hugely impactful on who says what to whom and who gets listened to. All right? So that's titles. I'll say a bit more about that in a tick. And then how to is, um, so if we've got something to say, we've kind of figured out the politics, I still need to be able to access, how do I do this skillfully? What do I say? How do I say it? When do I say it? What we call the nous. We called it nous when we first, you know the, the British term nous, and then we realised that nobody outside the UK understands <laughs> what nous means. <laughs> So we had to change it. Um, so we talked to, for example, uh, the uh, deputy chairman of a, of a very big advertising company said, I learned really quickly, don't challenge the chairman uh, in a group scenario. <laughs> don't do that. Wait, he said, I wait until it's me and him and we're travelling together and we're in a hotel somewhere and it's in the evening and we've just had our dinner and we've got a nice glass of red wine in front of us and he said, then I can say whatever I want, and he'll listen to me. That's nous. You know, that's the how-to. How-to with this person, how do I get heard? Now, um, let me just throw, s show some stats, actually, uh, from the... This is quite a wide uh, medical population. As I said, over 100 people that are attending the next conference, the appraiser conference. So this is their perspective. I asked, an, um, amongst a number of other questions, um, how often would these people, junior, middle and senior um, people, speak up about malpractice? How often would they challenge ways of working? How often would they offer ideas? Usually or always. 
And this was the response. So generally speaking, you know, more people are kind of speaking up about malpractice than other areas. Generally speaking, as we go more senior, the perception, by the way, this is just perception, it's not truth, it's just perception. The perception is that those are, that are more senior are more likely to speak up than those that are more junior. That's not always the case. Um, and we've got some, you know, is it sort of fairly low figures, actually, compared to some of the other organisations that I'm working with at the moment. So there's, there's a little bit of a reticence. I mean, this is worrying. That's worrying. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working with many organisations that have figures sort of over 80% uh, in that area. So, you know, this is something to, to, to kind of watch. Um, but then, of course, I asked um, the respondents, well, would you speak up about these things? What do you notice? They're quite good. Yeah, well, I'd speak up. Really? People aren't. Pe really? Other people aren't so good, but I'd speak up about it. Apart from this one, this is just slightly, you know, uh, we're quite good, not quite as good as that. So, you know, again, this sort of shows uh, a, a universal, actually. I've never worked with a single group that hasn't shown a pattern whereby other people don't speak up necessarily, but I always would. So something's going on there, <laughs> isn't it? We kind of need to turn the lens a little bit on ourselves and say, well, do we? Do we? Do we really? Would we? And why do we have these differences in perceptions? If we had longer, I could spend all day talking with you about, well, what's going on here? What's happening? So uh, just on the speaking up bit, I just want to leave you with uh, some traps. So speaking up, Here's three traps, they're not the only traps, but goodness me, they come up very often in terms of why we don't speak up or why, do, why we don't speak up effectively. So the first trap is we doubt ourselves. Have you heard of the imposter experience or the imposter syndrome more commonly known? Yeah. Um, so the imposter syndrome is that voice in your head. And I always say to audiences, it's okay to have a voice in your head. Uh, <laughs> we all do. It's that little voice that says, Psst, when are they going to find out you don't know what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> when are they going to find out that you were blagging it during that recruitment interview? <laughs> and now here you are. So we all have imposter voice. Um, many of us, it's quite loud and it prevents us from doing things. We can often be our own worst critic, yeah? You can't do it, you shouldn't do it, other people will do it better. Yeah, you'll muck this up. Now I have to say that I also work with people that need to have more imposter syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there are some people here that you just need a bit more doubt before you speak up. Um, but for many of us, you know, we, we, we silence ourselves. And, um, and with that trap, part of it obviously is noticing, ah, hello. It's that voice again. Yeah, I hear you. Now let me just question you. Let me just say, wait a second, I have done this well actually in the past. I can do it. So that's, that's, that's something to work with on the imposter voice. Um, another trap is we abdicate. And we abdicate for kind of two main reasons. Um, one is we sort of step back from responsibility. The most obvious one is oh, well, it's not really my job to say anything. Somebody else will say something. Somebody else will go to the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian. Somebody else will... Somebody more senior should do something about that. The regulator will spot that, so I don't need to say anything. It's not my job. Um, silence is a huge number of people. Gives us a certain sense of relief. It's not me, I don't have to do something and working with organisations who want a more transparent culture, we try and really push at that assumption. You know, hang on a second, what if it was your responsibility? What if you could do something? What would you do? You know, even if it wasn't, ta-da! But what could you do about this thing? And, and that helps people just take a little bit more responsibility. The other reason we abdicate is that we um, don't think anything will happen. 
So we go, I could speak up, but I won't because what's the point? Nothing will happen. And again, talk about a vicious <laughs> circle. And I've been in, in, in a few organisations where that story is so pervasive. There's no point, so why do it? No point, why, and it, so nothing changes until a few people are willing to go, well, you never know, maybe it will make a difference. I'm going to do it, let's see. And until you can get a critical mass of people taking it on board and going, actually, bloody hell, I'm going to, I'm going to even just in my team, I'm going to make something happen here. Um, then, you know, that really, that really sticks organisation cultures, keeps them in the same place. So we have to, again, question our assumptions, question that assumption around it's not my job or nothing will happen and sort of give us ourselves a bit of a kick uh, to do something. Um, the final one, I've called it we talk to ourselves. Um, by this I mean we speak up in a way that uses our own language and way of saying it rather than thinking about the other person and how they want to hear it and how they can hear it. Th perhaps the best way of understanding this one is to consider cross-cultural working. Yeah? You know, when you've got two people from different cultures and, and, and this person's speaking just from their own <coughs> culture and wondering why the other person's looking at them a bit strangely. I mean, it, it's... it's Wonderfully stereotypical, but it's a true story, so I'll, I'll tell you it. Uh, I was, uh, did a conference in Holland, um, and so I was speaking to a Dutch guy. Uh, uh, it was a very, very interesting conversation. Uh, and he was telling me about how he, his experiences of working over in Britain with a British team. And uh, so he said, for one thing, you know, the Dutch are quite well known for saying things fairly directly. Uh, and that's exactly what he did, he said. He went into the team and he just said things as they were. Uh, and he described a kind of British reaction to that, which was, <gasps> you can't say it like that. You've got to go round. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just go that. You've got to go round and take your time before you can say that. And then the other hilarious thing that he said was... Um, it took him a while when he asked his team, you know, what did you think of my presentation? And they would say, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it, it, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, you didn't think that they meant interesting, did you? <laughs> he was like, yep. <laughs> so you get how we can, we can speak at cross purposes. Uh, and the other thing that happens here is sometimes we work ourselves up to speak up and then we just, we're ready, and we just go, bleh. <laughs> and we haven't really thought about whether the other person is in a place and a position to really hear us. So this is, you know, this is really about seeing the other person's point of view. Can we put ourselves in that place and speak to that, not to this here? So maybe when you, you know, hear that, you know, which, ones, which ones resonate for you, uh, I wonder? Um, and I'll just take you quickly through the other side of the coin, the listening up, and then I'll, uh, 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 hopefully we'll have a, a few moments for some questions as well. So let me just talk to you about listening up. Now remember, this is the blind spot. So most people really talk and get interested about how do I speak up? We're really missing how do we enable other people to speak up, because we're in a system. Funnily enough, if you enable other people to speak up, it will eventually make it easier for you to speak up. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we create the culture. This is just as important. Trust here is you have to trust in the opinion of other people. You ain't going to listen to anybody unless at some level you think it's worth listening to. So do you value other people's opinions? Um, and, uh, you know nearly everybody would say, of course I do, absolutely, I, I, absolutely. But it's quite <coughs> likely that you value some people's opinion about some subjects, sometimes, <laughs> and not at others. And so that's the interesting thing to think about here, is who counts, yeah, and why? I'll say a bit more about that in a second. So trusting other people's opinions, risk, 
is around understanding that you may be scary. Okay? And um, by that I mean that you may not occupy you know, the chief executive <laughs> role, but for some people, they may think twice before speaking to you. And it might be because of your job title. It might be because of your network and who you know. It might be because of your body language, your appearance, your apparent confidence. Something will probably make you a little bit intimidating to some other people. And we often uh, dismiss that. So um, very often I, I work with people that, that say, you know, they think I'm you know, lovely and approachable. And you ask them and they go, no, 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 honestly, my team, they know that I'm approachable. And they are, they're lovely and approachable, but they've been given all these labels and been promoted over about two decades. And there they are thinking, but I'm still the same person, I'm lovely. And you're like, well, yeah, I know, but you're also, you've got all these titles which mean you're scary. So you may feel lovely, but you're scary, <laughs> okay? And you have to get that, you have to understand that. You have to understand that other people might might be intimidated, yeah? Um, so that's what understanding risk is about. Un understanding politics is around why are you getting to hear the things that you're getting to hear. So listening up skillfully means why am I hearing this? If I'm in a position of power, are, is somebody telling me something in order to send it on to others? The example I often use here is... Um, uh, just to illustrate it, is it, it again a true story? I work with a team um, uh, running a business simulation, a leadership simulation at Ashridge. And uh, this same team said that in a few months' time they were going to be visited by a member of the royal family um, as part of an official tour. And I got a call the day before the tour and something had happened and somebody had dropped out and anyway, it was a bit chaotic. And they said, um, promise you, Megan, at 11.04 tomorrow, this member of the British royal family is coming to our office and, quote, we need to be doing something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, can you run that, simulate that bit of the simulation with us? Uh, and, uh, and so I had to qualify it because I was just like, so you're asking me to simulate the simulation <laughs> <laughs> for the member of the royal family? And they're like, yep. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, the member of the royal family is probably none the wiser that what they're seeing at 11.04 is, is a play, <laughs> is a <laughs> performance. Um, and, uh, you know, that phrase, you know, the, wherever the queen goes, it smells of fresh paint because everybody's been polishing stuff. Now, uh, you know, I know that none of you, as far as I'm aware, are members of the royal family, but if you're in a position of responsibility mm, at a lesser degree, this kind of smokescreen is probably happening to some level, you know, because people want you to think a certain way about them. It's classic when you get to board level and you get people coming in to present their department's work. You know, and not only have they been you know, working for about two weeks intensively for this five-minute presentation that they're about to give, they're also thinking very carefully about what to show and what not to show. And if you're in that position of responsibility, listening up well means... How do, you, how do you spot that and ask really good questions so that people can open up more? Yeah. So that's, again, political games. Titles, we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about, you know, how do the titles affect what you get to hear? Yeah, and, and again, um, Amazon, when we started this um, project, there was, I don't know whether you remember, because it was 2015, the Wall Street Journal, no, was it the Wall Street Journal? New York Times, the New York Times had run an article on Amazon's bruising culture in its warehouses, and it created a bit of a social media storm 
a lot of backlash on Amazon's working practices. And Jeff Bezos, the chief executive, in an interview said, um, I do not recognize the Amazon that is described in this article. Um, at which point I thought, well, with the best will in the world, you wouldn't, because you wouldn't know. You d it, with the best will in the world, you are very unlikely to be able to see what is going on at that level. You need, you need to be really skilled to figure out what is going on in parts of your organization. And that's, so that's true for, true for all of us if we are occupying positions of power. And the how to is, you know, how do you get, how do you ask the right questions, where and when? How do you help people to speak up? I worked with a chief, new chief executive um, who was uh, very bemused because she came into her leadership team and her leadership team agreed with everything she said. Uh, and she, hilariously, she experimented for a while to see, you know, how ridiculous <laughs> can, I, can I make these suggestions? And they were all just nodding their heads. And as it turned out, the, the previous um, chief executive had been uh, uh, quite a formidable character from the military. And, uh, and just everybody had got used to just nodding their heads <laughs> and saying something. And so she introduced a devil's advocate card. You may have heard about this. You know, you, one person of the team held the card, and it was their job to challenge uh, in that meeting. And it, it was really uncomfortable for the team really uncomfortable for a while and then it became normal and they didn't need the card anymore so it's just these sorts of lots of skills and strategies how do you help people to talk how do you help them to challenge what questions do you ask you know if you've just made a presentation as a, as a senior leader and say to the group uh, so what do you think <laughs> guess what most of them will probably go yeah, yeah oh, great but if you, I, I spoke to one manager whose question, he, he said he asked the question, I thought this was great, he said, um, what do you all know that I will never get to know, but I really need to? <laughs> and I thought, you know, these sorts of questions, or if there was to be a challenge that somebody would give me on this, what would it be? The, the, the way we phrase questions enables people to speak up or just silences them. It's a vitally important area. Um, and uh, listening up in your experience, well, this is, again, the group that I'm uh, speaking with in a little while. Uh, we asked whether senior people, those senior to you, how do they listen up? How often do they listen up to malpractice? How often do they listen up to ideas? How often do they listen up when you're challenging ways of working? Um, it was a bit disappointing, yeah? So this is always or usually listen up. So, you know, less than half here, and you've still got a quarter that are saying that actually my senior person does not usually or always listen up when I'm talking about malpractice. Um, fortunately, um, <laughs> Fortunately, they listen up really well. Um, no, and, and again, this is a pattern throughout organisations. And, you know, at some level, it can't be right, can it? Because we're asking at each level, does the person above you listen? No, they don't, but I do. No, they don't, but I do. So, blind, real blind spot around listening up. And the traps... Uh, see which one of these maybe uh, resonates. I've mentioned this. One trap is we forget that we're scary. Um, I, uh, I, I did an a NHS Leadership Academy talk down in Gatwick uh, a few months back, and uh, a lady linked in with me at, uh, after a few days afterwards. She told me this great story. She said, I really thought about you, because I've just been in a meeting uh, at the hospital, and a gentleman has just introduced himself using eight titles. <laughs> she counted them. So eight titles were given. Um, but the really interesting thing is, she, she wrote all this and I was chuckling away. And then at the end of her message, she said, and it's taken me about three days to kind of write to you because you're a professor. <laughs> and I didn't want to waste your time. And I was a bit, you know, I didn't know whether to bother you. And I was just like, gosh, you know what? I do research in this area, and I still forget 
that people find me scary. And I'm like, I'm not scary in the slightest. Yes, I am to some people because of the labels that they put on me. So I thought that was absolutely fascinating. So we need to see ourselves from other people's perspective, not our own. Yeah, so a real blind spot. Um, so we, we interviewed a, a chief executive again who uh, said some amazing things uh, for anybody that works in kind of culture and HR. He was saying, diversity counts. I really want my team to speak up. I want my team to bring their whole selves to work, is what they were saying, which is a phrase you may have heard. Uh, so we were delighted with this, obviously. And then he paused and he said, but of course I do have my little list of those people that fit and those people that don't. <laughs> uh, and he, he would look at his little list to, to figure out who to listen to or not. And, um, and we all have our little lists, yeah? We all have a little list of whose opinion counts. And a lot of it's to do with these titles. Um, and another, by the way, another thing I ask in the survey is how often does race, gender, job title, and age affect how you listen to other people? And in many audiences, including the audience I'm about to speak to, the response is race and gender never or rare, I think it's never or rarely affect how I listen to somebody else, usually over 90% respond that race and gender do not affect the, the way that they listen. Oh, yes, it does. Yeah. Because of unconscious bias, because of the, um, the way we've been drip-fed images, fairy stories, celebrities, whatever it is, through our lives, race, gender, job title, and age will affect whose opinion counts. And the most dangerous thing in the world we can do is pretend that it doesn't affect it at all because it shouldn't. Just because we don't want it to affect the way we listen doesn't mean it doesn't. So with this, a lot of what we have to do is recognize, you know what, I have a list. Of course I have a list. It's human nature to have a list. Lists can be really useful. They discern, yeah? You need a list to figure out who to speak to, but you do need to check the list and how you created it and question it quite a lot. And the last one is, uh, I love this one, um, so uh, traps to listening up, we send the wrong signals. So we send shut up signals rather than speak up signals. And the example I usually give is um, in groups like this and mentioning no names, as I look around the audience, I usually have one or two people in a group when I talk that, that catch my eye because <laughs> people hiding now. Uh, they catch my eye. It's, it's not you. Don't I? It, they catch my eye because they do this. Right the way through. Like that. <laughs> At least they're awake, yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm busily thinking, oh, God, I'm talking rubbish. Uh, and sometimes, very often, they'll be the person at the end that comes up and goes, that was so interesting. <laughs> and I'm like, really? And you find out that this is their thinking face. <laughs> yeah? And everything about them is exuding kind of stay away. <laughs> but actually, they're thinking. And uh, a colleague of mine, Nancy Klein, has a lovely phrase. She says, um, know your face. <laughs> do you know what your face is doing right now? And not just your face, your body. What signals are you sending? And very often, we don't, we don't know what this kit is sending us. This, the Dutch guy that I referred to earlier had a real argument with me about this. Uh, so he was sat in the audience, and being Dutch, he was a six foot five, <laughs> massive guy. And he was like, I am not scary. <laughs> <laughs> People find me really approachable. And I had, to, I, I had to, at one point, just say, I'm finding you scary. <laughs> so we have to realize that we, we may not <coughs> mean to, but we send those signals. And, and sometimes we're brilliant at this, but one day 
we are really tired and stressed and that's the day where we, we just cut somebody off. And if we're in a position of power, frustratingly, that's the story that everybody then talks about, yeah? It's not the nine times out of ten they're fabulous. It's the, did you hear what happened to Bob when he spoke up this morning? <laughs> and suddenly it's like, don't speak up, you know what will happen? These stories can be very, very, very strong, okay? And they can really silence. So um, just to sort of, oh my gosh, right, I need to, uh, oh, that's slightly fast, I need to, to finish. So we've been working at individual team and organisational levels. There's processes and procedures, there's forums, there's the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian Network, really, really important. So one of the things we do is just to see, you know, what facilities, processes do you have inside an organisation that enable people to speak up? We very often run sort of workshops um, that are use diagnostic, use surveys, but they're based on inquiry normally. So this is me talking at you. But very often we would be saying, right, share your stories. What happens here? What do you need to change? So what are you going to change? And we run inquiry processes over time. That, I think, is very uh, helpful. And coaching. Systemic reviews mean that um, you've got to make sure as far as possible that you're sending the right messages from all sorts of positions. So, for example, uh, I've worked with uh, an organisation that talks a lot about transparency, but their performance management framework essentially doesn't pay any attention to whether people are good at listening up or speaking up. It, it, it sort of rewards competition, as far as I can see. We spoke, talked to another organisation recently that has two corporate values. One corporate value, transparency, great. Another corporate value says exactly this, positive about change. So you can be transparent as long as you're positive about change. <laughs> so we, that is all about, just hang on a second, let's make sense of all of these messages and can, can we kind of point them in the right direction? This is one that uh, is my uh, particular research area. Um, we can, uh, suffice to say here, we've, we've run a big study at Ashridge examining how we can train the brain through mindfulness exercises. Um, and one thing that we discovered was you can train people over a sustained period of time to be more choiceful in their responses. So, um, that was the answer to all of the traps. You need to know your face, you need to question the list, you need to listen to the imposter voice when it comes up. All of these things basically require a level of mindfulness, present moment awareness of thoughts, feelings and sensations. If you don't have that, you're on automatic pilot and you won't change habits. So changing conversational habits means altering these choice points uh, and there's some, some really positive, um, uh, positive results from some of our, our work in this area, but a load more that needs to be done. Uh, so speaking and listening up, you know, it's, it's personal, but it's also organisational imperative. Um, remember, it's, lis it's relational. We talk a lot about speaking up and less about listening up. Um, <laughs> Changing habits, our own habits, in what we say and how we say it and who we listen to, God, that's really, really hard, actually, to alter that. And then when you look at team habits and organisational habits, it's, uh, it's no mean feat. Where I'm particularly looking at is how do we train ourselves to be more choiceful and therefore change habits, and that shows uh, a reasonable amount of potential. Uh, if you're interested in um, other resources. Um, that one is, uh, a, that's like a mini TEDx on the listening up bit. So you'll hear some of the messages in that one. You can find that on YouTube. These are Harvard Business Review um, articles, both on the mindfulness work and also the, the speaking truth to power. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just do, do, do contact me. I realise that it's a bit of a romp through quite a lot of research. So if you have questions, 
I really am delighted. I'm really approachable. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you can come uh, and, and do uh, ask me questions. Um, I've left, I think, according to my watch, five minutes. So if there are, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear any questions. Also, I know that there's a number of people from particularly the Freedom to Speak Up guardians in, in the audience. So I don't know, what I was quite interested in your perspective on some of this, but if there's any like one or two last questions, I'd be delighted to, delighted to take them. Yes? Megan, hi, my name is Mark Tassel, I'm a consultant oncologist. I want to ask you a little bit about the freedom to speak up within the context of the NHS. All organisations have these sort of whistleblowing policies and things like that. But my perception of things is that the policy in reality is slightly different. If you read Private Eye, there's always cases of doctors and other people being suspended from positions where they've spoken out, yeah. accused of negligence, bullying, and harassment. Yeah. After a prolonged period, very difficult for them and their families, yeah. they're either acquitted or found to be wrong. Yeah. That's very difficult. Yeah. And these cases are happening ongoing. How do you think we can change that? Because that's the elephant in the room with all this. Everybody knows what the, the impact can be, yeah. even though it's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I really hear what you're saying, and I mean, um, uh, it's very difficult to see examples out in the press where the whistleblowing process has worked really wonderfully. <laughs> um, uh, and Barclays comes to mind recently. I don't know whether you remember that somebody used the whistleblowing line at, at, at Barclays, and then the chief executive got into a lot of trouble when he tried to find out who was the person that uh, spoke up. We have quite a few examples of that in the interviews. Um, so a, a lot of this is around the stories that we create about afterwards and how we treat and deal with uh, whistleblowers or people that have spoken up. That's, that's, the, that's the concern, really. Yeah. Because I think that's, it's just, these are extreme examples. Yeah. But they're ongoing. Yeah. And, and, and I would focus not just on the extreme examples but the the smaller examples so in our survey we asked people how often or how likely do you think it will be that you will be supported rewarded punished or ignored if you speak up with ideas also with challenges and the statistics are really poor in just terms of expecting punished so do you think one of the difficulties about this is just that people have have to, have to get to a point where they think oh my god this is terrible and they stand up I think ongoing conversations are more important because I think that's one of the things that we probably should think about within the NHS is ongoing conversations rather than... They're both. Okay. They're both vital. Um, and uh, I would never say that you focus solely on a whistleblowing policy. You absolutely at the same time have to focus on, trans on conversations, on dialogue. But similarly, you can't pretend that stuff is going to always surface in those sorts of conversations because we live in a political, risky environment. So you also have to put your efforts to making sure that there's a kind of safer version of versions and forums around as well. Do, do, do you want to, yes? Yeah. And in part, what we have to do is to keep going back to challenge those people. Yeah. Um, to make sure that they do the right thing as well. Not yes. the people that have whistleblown, but, but the, the people, people receiving the messages. Receiving. And that's probably, for me, one of the most challenging things about the role is to make sure that I yes. heard on behalf of other people. Lovely. I mean, just to carry the, 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 the resources of the state, which is the problem. Well, it, it, there is never one problem. No, so that, you know, that it's, 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 it's when, it's when the organised, when the forces of, in the NHS, at least the forces of the state, when they're focused on the individual, can be a, a, a perception. It can be a real challenge for people. I, I think, and I'll leave it here because I know that it, it's just getting to ten o'clock. But what I would like to pick up from that conversation is again the importance of the stories we tell around, you know, what happens if you speak up. Um, are you listened to? When are you listened to? Is it worth it? You know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's making sure that if people are speaking up, whether it's whistleblowing or in conversations with their line manager, mm. the response is so vital. 
Because if it's met, a bit like that nine times out of ten, you can do it well, but that one time, that one time where the whistleblower loses their job or it ends in tragedy, or the one time where the boss really kind of goes, what, and reacts badly, that's, those stories circulate and they become reality and they lead to that abdication that I was talking about. They lead to the like, this is just not worth us doing. This is a huge conversation, but I have to end it, uh, end it here. I hope that's been thought-provoking and I hope it might change a couple of conversations. Um, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>